see you. My mic on? Yes, I'm on. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Church. It is uh, good to be with you, to be seen by you, uh, to have a pretty big, you know, live studio audience here with us. So a uh, big shout out to the Hannah Life Group, to the Atkin Life Group, Yo Pros, uh, anybody else I missed uh, that's here. It is, it is good to be with you. Oh, I need to put it on my ear. Making sure I'm watching my producers. There we go. All right. Hopefully you heard that. Uh, okay. I, I got a pretty loud voice, so you probably heard that. Go ahead and turn your Bibles over to Luke chapter 22. Um, as we start, just wanted to give some good news, right? We are all about, we are people of the gospel. We are people of good news. And um, as I told you last week, uh, last Saturday, Randy and Amber Austin were baptized into Christ. And uh, yeah, amen, after uh, studying with the words and the sayings and the gardeners, they decided to make Jesus Lord of their lives and get baptized into Christ. And then last night, a young man by the name of Savion Best, nicknamed Savvy, <laughs> was baptized into Christ. So Savion, you can stand on up for us. That's Savvy. <laughs> amen. Amen. So uh, uh, James Kelly and I have been studying the Bible with him and uh, he said, man, I'm ready to make Jesus Lord of my life. And yesterday he was baptized into Christ. Um, but I was telling him he's kind of like the Ethiopian because he, he's got a job. He works. Uh, actually, that's how we met. He was out selling uh, pest control, came knocking on my door. And, uh, you know, we started having a conversation and he was trying to sell me on pest control. Well, little did he know I was going to be trying to sell him on Jesus. And um, so, we, you know, we started talking about God. We started studying the Bible. And um, like I said, he got baptized. But in a couple of weeks, his job is taking him up to Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, he's, he's, he's really good at his job. He's going to be training other people up there to do that. And, um, but I told him, you know, it's funny how life works. A guy by the name of Kevin Thompson, who was my first campus minister at Georgia Tech, uh, leads our sister church up there in Wilmington. So I'm going to be hooking him up with Kevin. And um, he said, but he might be back next summer uh, to cover this territory as well for his company. But amen. You know, it is not just about getting new members to our church, but it is about making disciples of Jesus, right? And so I'm so excited uh, to, be, to be a part of your story, brother, and so excited for you. Um, you probably see on the slide up there, we're going to be doing a workshop. You know, we've seen a couple of souls won to Christ here recently, and we want to see more, right? We want to follow Jesus, be good news, and make disciples, right, in our homes, our communities, and our surrounding areas. So I'm going to be leading a workshop uh, winning souls to Christ. Um, and it's going to be a couple of Saturdays over the next few months. These are the dates, September 26th, and there's several dates on to December 12th. Um, the classes are going to be at 10 a.m. right here in the building from 10 to 11, 30 a.m. And we're also going to be putting it on Zoom for those of you that don't feel comfortable coming. But if you are coming, please wear your mask. We're going to physically distance. Uh, we are going to record the Zoom uh, uh, the, the Zoom sessions as well. So if you miss it, uh, you can get caught up. We're really just going to talk about, you know, how to help people become Christians, right? Because God has given us the mission, right, to be fishers of men, to follow him, and to make disciples of all nations. Amen? So awesome. Well, uh, we've been in this series, Jesus and You. Let's see, are we on? Is this on? Like, there we go. Uh, we've been in this series called Jesus and You. There we go. And, um, whoa. That was way too much. Too many clicks. There we go. One too many. All right. Uh, we've been talking about Jesus and Peter. So a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Jesus had vision for Peter's life. Right? When he first met him, he said, you will be called Cephas. And secondly, uh, we looked last week at Jesus chose to disciple him and really train him, right, to be able to go and do that with others. Today, as we look at sort of the end of Peter's story, I want to look at uh, this idea of grace. That really Jesus' story with Peter, when we talk about Jesus and you, Jesus and Peter, it is a story of grace and a fisherman. It is a story of God's immeasurable and incredible grace. And so uh, we're going to pick up right in the Last Supper. So if you turn over to Luke chapter 22, um, we're going to pick up in the last few days uh, or last really few hours of Jesus' life on earth and his interactions with Peter during those last few hours. We're going to start in uh, Luke 22 and down in verse uh, 31. And it reads, Simon, Simon, behold, 
Satan has asked permission to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. But he said to him, Lord, I'm willing to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said to him, pardon me, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. And so when I think about this first section, you know, as you, as you look at what had happened here, they had just, they had had the last supper. During the last supper, Jesus told them, one of you is going to betray me. And how did they handle that news? They started arguing about who's the greatest, right? And in the midst of this conversation, Jesus tells them, hey, this is not how you're supposed to be. You need to be a servant of all. And then he hones in on Peter and he says, notice this, he doesn't even call him Peter. He says, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. Now, my first thought, again, this series, Jesus and You, is the idea is to put ourselves in these characters' shoes, in these people's shoes, in these disciples' shoes. And my first thought would have been, well, did you tell him no? I mean, you're God's son. Tell him no. (laughs) He asked to sift me. And what that's going back to is this idea of what happened to Job, right? His mind would have immediately thought when, when, when Satan came and said, hey, can I mess up Job's life? And God's like, all right, just don't touch him, but you can do whatever else you want. And so when Jesus says this to Peter, if I were Peter, I'd be like, so tell him no. (laughs) But Jesus doesn't do that. And so uh, Jesus is kind of like, no, I'm not going to tell him no. So Peter, I can imagine, is like, "Well, well, what's the solution then? I'll pray for you, Peter. Wait. Okay, so Satan is about to wreck my life and all you're saying you're going to do, you who can stop the wind and waves, you're just going to pray for me? That's your solution, Jesus? You're going to pray for me? That's it? And so you can imagine Peter's mindset, right? And not only that, does Jesus only say, I'm just going to pray for you. He then says, guess what? You're going to fail. You're going to betray me. You're going to leave me. But when you've turned back, when you've turned things around, come back and strengthen your brothers. And so I can, if, you, if you can imagine Peter's mindset, I think he felt like, no way. That's why he got so vehement and he started insisting emphatically, I'll go with you to prison and death. And even if all these other guys, can you imagine that pride? Even if all these other guys, James, John, Andrew, and the rest, even if they deny you, I never will. Right? But Jesus ultimately proved right. We know as we're going to see at the end of this story that Peter did indeed fail. Point number one is God's grace is sufficient. What I mean by that is the fact that God has already factored in your stupidity your sinfulness, your tendency to pride, your mistakes, your possible errors. He factored all that in and he still chose you. So when, when Paul says that Jesus told him, my grace is sufficient, sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. What he's saying there is, guess what? You're going to have some sin. You're going to have some trouble. You're going to blow it. You're going to mess up, but I still want you on my team. And so if we look at the story of of Jesus and Peter, think about your own life, because it is so easy to get bogged down and start worrying about the mistakes. Right. I was talking to uh, we were talking with Carly yesterday and she brought up something from like a month ago. Some 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 she had made a mistake on something and nobody there had remembered it or even thought about it since it happened. Right. But our tendency is right, because Satan is the great accuser. He gets in our head and he replays things. And suddenly you're thinking about this time you had an awkward conversation in third grade with a boy in the hallway. And you can't go to sleep, (laughs) right? And so that's not how God wants us to be. He knows that you're fallible. Psalm 103 says he remembers that we're dust, but he still wants to indwell you. He still wants to put his Holy Spirit in you. And so when you think about, I think about myself, the mistakes I've made pre and post baptism, right? Think about Sabbath. He got baptized last night. Guess what? Maybe at the restaurant we went to afterwards, he might've had a sinful thought. Or maybe on his way home, or maybe even this morning. Who knows? But God factored that in and still said, I'm going to forgive your sins and give you the gift of the Holy Spirit because you're choosing to make Jesus Lord of your life. So first thing I want you to think about when you look at Jesus and Peter is think about the fact that God's grace is sufficient to cover your mistakes, errors, or possible things that you could do wrong. Amen? The second thing I wanted to look at, here we go, is, I skipped too much. There we go. Grace holds us accountable. Look over in Mark chapter 14. Look over in Mark chapter 14. So we're going to bounce around a little bit. Actually, I'm going to do a lot more reading of Scripture probably than talking, which is good, right? Because God's Word is what really changes our lives, not the preacher's eloquence. Amen? (laughs) So over in Mark chapter 14, 
Uh, after this scenario at dinner, Jesus goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane. He brings his closest friends in. And this is the scene we see over in Mark 14. And we're going to look at verse 32. It says, they came to a place named Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here until I have prayed. And he took with him Peter and James and John and began to be very distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And he went a little farther and fell to the ground and began to pray that if it were possible, the hour might pass him by. And as he was saying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. And then he came and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you, still, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you may not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went, again, went away and prayed, saying the same thing. And the story goes on. So the second point I want to look at today is grace holds us accountable. You see, Jesus brings us his closest disciples and closest friends. And he makes this startling confession. He says, I'm so sad, I feel like I'm going to die. I am in such turmoil and distress that it, death is better than what I'm feeling right now. And he gets super serious. He brings me, he says, please, I just need one thing from you guys. Stay here and keep watching. Pray with me. And he goes, and if you know from the other accounts, he's sweating. He's praying so fervently, he starts to sweat blood. I imagine he's crying and praying out. He's like, God, if there's any other way, Father, let this pass. He doesn't want to go to the cross, right? He doesn't want to get brutally tortured. And after praying, he comes back. And what does he find these guys doing? sleeping. And so look at what he does here. He doesn't even speak to the whole group. Who does he speak to? He says, Simon, couldn't you keep watch for one hour? This is the biblical equivalent of you had one job, <laughs> right? Stay up and pray, right? And in his greatest hour of need, these guys, basically they fail him. And the thing about grace holding us accountable is that, guess what? Grace holds us accountable in that Jesus will call us out on our behavior. Now, this doesn't mean that you need to feel guilty, but grace doesn't mean that I can just do whatever I want and there are no consequences. Grace doesn't mean I have a license to sin. Oh, well, he'll cover it. So let me just go ahead and look at this internet site. Let me lose my cool and start yelling at my family and my wife because grace covers me. No, grace holds us accountable. I mean, think about some of the stories with Jesus, right? The woman caught in adultery. He has grace. He doesn't stone her. The only person there who has a right to stone her is Jesus, and he doesn't do it. But does the story end there? He says, go now and leave your life of sin. Grace is holding her accountable. He showed her grace, but it holds you accountable to change. The woman at the well. I mean, that is, if you want to talk about awkward conversations. So, go call your husband. I don't have a husband. You're right, lady, when you say you don't have a husband. You've had five. And the man you're shacking up with now, he's not your husband either. But how does that story end? With her telling her entire village, I found the Savior of the world. He showed her grace but she was still held accountable for her behavior. So here's the deal. In our interactions with one another, in our interactions with God, know that, yes, we will be forgiven, but also know that Hebrews 4 talks about the eyes of him, right? He, God sees everything in creation, and you're going to be held accountable for every thought, for every deed, even for the intentions of the heart. When you didn't say the cuss word out loud, but the guy cut you off in crap traffic, and you said it in your brain. You're going to be held accountable. Grace, yes, our sins are forgiven, but we are going to have to give account before God for our actions one day. Amen? So we can look at Peter and see that he was still held accountable even though God was giving him grace. Let's keep moving. I was like, why do I keep um, uh, adding a new slide? It's because I didn't go into the, the PowerPoint mode. It's like I'm hitting enter and it's adding a new slide. Look over back in uh, Luke chapter 22. I'm sorry, in John 18. We're going to go to John 18. Um, short verse here. So after this, right, Jesus gets arrested. You can imagine what's going through Peter's head. He gets rebuked here, more or less for falling asleep, right? He, he, had, he had said, I'll, I'll go with you to prison and death. And then the one thing I ask you to do, he falls asleep. And then they go, they go uh, to, into the garden. Jesus is praying and a, a crowd comes up to arrest 
Jesus. We're going to pick up in John 18 and verses 10 to 12. It says here, so they come to arrest Jesus. And verse 10 of John 18 says, Simon Peter then, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword in its place. Shall I not drink the cup the father has given me? So the Roman cohort and the commander and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. So again, what's going through Peter's head, right? He had just emphatically said, I'll never leave you, Jesus. But then falling asleep, he saw Jesus sad and sweating blood. The most powerful man in the world in what seems to be a moment of weakness. Then one of their 12, one of their closest friends leads a mob to arrest Jesus. I mean, can you imagine the emotion is going through Peter's brain, disappointment, anger, guilt, all sorts of things are going on. So they come up to arrest Jesus. And what is Peter saying? You know what? I'm about to prove my loyalty right now. And he takes a sword and he cuts off a guy's ear. But between me and you and the lamppost, I don't think Peter was going for his ear. He missed, right? He was trying to kill this guy. And once again, Jesus rebukes him. And when these guys realize that all right, Jesus is not going to defend himself here. He's not about to overthrow the Romans and set up a Jewish empire. They all flee. They all run away. They all leave Jesus and he gets arrested. The point I see in Peter's life here is grace doesn't mean that you need to take matters into your own hands. Because God has given you grace doesn't mean that you need to try to figure out and solve all your problems with human means. I mean, think about it. How many times do we try to solve things using methods and means outside of God's will? How many times do we try to justify something that we're doing with, oh, the end is going to justify the means? Think about the idea, even, uh, you know, the woman the well, shacking up. We live in a culture that says, well, you got to really know if you can be married. So let's move in together first. Right? That's fine. You need to figure it out if you're really compatible. God says, no, don't even let there be a hint of immorality in your life. Right. Think about uh, how many of us spend hours and hours at a job, not spending time with our family, our children, our spouses for the in the sake or in the name of I got to make enough money and provide. But are you providing a comfortable, loving home or are you just providing a big bank account? And it's not that those things have to be mutually exclusive. Right. It's fine to work hard and be successful. But does it come before your family? And you say, oh, but I'm providing. Right. In the ministry, how many times is it, you know, Natasha may say to me, honey, I need more help at home. But, oh, this person, I need to get with this person and have another prayer walk, another appointment. But in my own home, my wife is frustrated because I'm not doing dishes or laundry. I mean, how many times do we try to say, well, well, grace is going to cover me and I'm going to take care of this through my own hands. Right. Grace humbly relies on God. And one of the biggest areas that shows up is in our parenting, right? We, we, we often feel like, man, the best thing I can do for my kids is to make sure they get a good education, which in a lot of ways that has some truth to it. But let me ask you this. Does it matter if your kids go to Harvard if they go to hell? I mean, yes, education is important. We really, really value education in our life. But before that, the, the, my, my first job, my first goal is to impress God's commands upon my children and to bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. It's not making sure they have a 4.0 GPA so they can get into Georgia Tech. Right? We need to rely on God's means and not our means. And that's what Peter did. He took it into his own hands. He said, I'm going to fight for you. And Jesus is like, this is not the way. This is not what I came to do. Right? Grace means humbly relying on God and not your own means or methods. Look over in Luke chapter 22. I know we're flipping around a lot. So Peter cuts off this guy's ear. I love what Luke's account says. Jesus picks up the man's ear and heals him. Talk about grace. You want to talk about grace. People are coming to arrest Jesus and he's healing them and not fighting them. So Jesus gets arrested and they all flee. But then Peter suddenly, I imagine, gets some remorse, gets some guilt and says, man, I just said I'd go with him to prison and death. All right. So Peter gets some gumption and he starts following at a distance. And over in Luke chapter 22, starting in verse 54, he goes down to the courtyard and we're going to see what happens. Luke 22 and verse 54 says, having arrested him, they led him away and brought him to the house of the high priest. But Peter was following at a distance. After they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter was sitting among them. And a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the firelight and looking intently at him, said, this man was with him too. 
But he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. A little while later, another saw him and said, you are one of them too. But Peter said, man, I am not. After about an hour had passed, another man began to insist, certainly this man was also with them, for he is a Galilean too. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. Immediately while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So you think falling asleep on Jesus is bad. You think calling out all your other guys, like you guys, if you, even if you guys leave Jesus, I wouldn't. You think trying to kill somebody is bad, but it gets worse. Right? So he kind of tries to come back. And I love what it says here. He was following Jesus at a distance. Let that be a small lesson to us. Are we going to follow Jesus? Or are you just going to try to follow at a distance? Are we going to blend into the world? Just try to fit in? Not be noticed, not be seen? Or are we going to be bold disciples of Jesus? Right? Because, again, you, you, you can't be the salt of the earth if you taste like everything else. Okay? But... Peter starts feeling remorse about fleeing. So he goes and, and he comes to see what's happening. I wonder, you know, when this is happening, I wonder how it could have slipped his mind that just a few hours earlier, Jesus said, you're going to deny me. So I always think when I look at this story, wouldn't it have triggered the first time he said, no, I don't know him. But I guess so much was going on. I mean, remember, he had just tried to kill a guy. He had seen Jesus sweat blood, maybe even seen the angel appear and strengthen Jesus. I mean, a lot had happened in these few hours. And so it's easy to judge Peter and say, Peter and say how could you do that? But think about ourselves. How many times are you feeling tempted with sin and the Holy Spirit says to you, go pray. Get out of that situation. Call or text a brother or sister and you don't do it. All right. So before we judge Peter, let's think about our own lives. Let's examine our own lives. And so what happens is Peter gets so scared. He gets so afraid that basically He gets to the point of being worried about a little girl, a little servant girl saying, weren't you with him too? Did my slides disappear? No. Um, You can go to the next slide. Um, So Matthew gives us a little bit more information, and I love what he shares here. If you combine Matthew 26 and Luke 24, he says, you know, this third time, then he started to curse and to swear with an oath. I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. Then the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter, and Peter remembered the Lord's, and it goes on. So I like to think about this scene. Peter's warming himself. He denies Jesus once and then walks over to another area. Somebody else recognizes him. He denies Jesus again. Right? The third time, he's so afraid, he's so worried that he starts to call down curses on himself. He's basically to the point of saying, I don't bleep any bleep. Know that man up there. Right? Because they were in the courtyard. And it says Jesus was close enough to turn and look right at him. I think it might have been the rooster crowing, but I also think Peter made such a ruckus that probably everybody in the courtyard turned and looked at him. I don't blah, 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 cuss word, cuss word, cuss word. In the name of the Lord, I don't know him. And it says, Jesus turned and looked right at Peter. I can't imagine what that, what, those, what that was like looking at, looking right into the eyes of the Lord after saying, I'll go with you to prison and death. I'll kill for you, Jesus. But now I'm, 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 a, I'm a cussing and fussing fisherman because I got scared of some people saying I knew you. Right. The, the, the point here that I like to make is that grace is there. Let's go back to the previous slide. Grace is there for your lowest moment or your lowest moments. I think for Peter, this was probably his lowest moment. Right. And kind of like the State Farm jingle, like a good savior, his grace is there. <laughs> right? Like, even in your lowest moment. For me, that was in 2003. I made some terrible decisions. This is after baptism, after being a disciple about three years. Got involved again in immorality. Made some really poor choices as a disciple of Jesus. And had just a, a month, so basically a year of really, really struggling. And I wept bitterly a lot like Peter did. But guess what? His grace was there. His grace was there. What was it for you? Or what has it been for you? Pre or post baptism, whatever your lowest moment is, whatever you felt like you were the scum of the earth, you did you did something you could never believe, and man, I wish I'd never done that, and I'll never do that again. Whatever that moment was, His grace is there. His grace is there. 
So we can remove that guilt. Your name, if you're like Savvy and you got baptized into Christ, your name is written in the book of heaven. I'm in the book of life. Jesus is, God looks down and he sees Jesus and you. He sees Jesus and Jesus. <laughs> it's the blood of Jesus that covers you, right? His grace is there for no matter how you've messed up, no matter how you've blown it, his grace is there. Final thing I want to point out. Grace leads to repentance and restoration. I don't have time uh, to read it today, but over in John chapter 21, if you want to write down uh, 15 through 22, it's one of the the resurrection appearances, right? Sunday morning, Mary comes and tells them, right? But they don't believe that Jesus was risen. So Peter and John rush to the tomb. I love the detail John gives that he outraced Peter to the tomb. John is faster than Peter. I love that the Holy Spirit told him, put that in there just to rub it in a little bit, (laughs) right? You're faster. But they go and then they, they walk away wondering what happened. If you want to write down 1 Corinthians 15, 5 and Luke 24, 34, those verses actually tell us that Jesus appeared to Peter. Now, for some reason, none of the gospel writers tell us about that appearance. But at some point on that Sunday morning, Jesus does show up and appear explicitly to Peter. And then he appears to the 11. He tells them to go to Galilee. They go to Galilee. They don't find Jesus. So Peter starts fishing again. And then Jesus gives them another miraculous catch to remind them of when they first followed Jesus in Luke 5, right? He wanted to take them back to the beginning. And then they have breakfast, right? And in that breakfast, Jesus and Peter go on a walk. And he says to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Because remember, you just said, remember a couple weeks ago, you said, even if they all fall away, I won't. Guess what? They never denied me the way you did. Do you really love me more than these? Then he asks him again, do you love me? Do you truly love me? Right? And Peter's like, yes, Lord. He's like, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. And then finally he asks him a third time, Peter, do you love me? And the Greek there really says, basically, are you my friend? Peter, do you even like me? Right? And of course, Jesus, and he says, Jesus, you know all things. You know that I love you. He says, feed my lambs. And then he gives him this prophecy. Guess what? You're going to go where you don't want to go. You're going to die. You're going to get crucified upside down. And they have this whole conversation. He looks around and sees John following him. And he's like, what about him? And Jesus is like, don't worry about him. If I want him to remain alive until I return, what's that to you? You got to follow me. And I love that John points out, it says, a rumor started among the brothers that this disciple would not die. Who started the rumor? The rumor? Peter. He was the only guy privy to that conversation, right? But at the end of it, Jesus says, follow me. He, he restored him. There was repentance and restoration. Peter decides again, I'm going to follow Jesus with all my heart. He preaches the first gospel sermon, right? And 3,000 people get baptized on Pentecost. So let, you know, let his grace, like it says in Titus, teach you to say no to ungodliness and unworldliness, right? Let grace lead you to repentance and restoration because we have a savior that says, if you follow me, my grace will cover you past, present, and future until I see you again and give you that big hug on the first day that you enter heaven. Amen. So this is the story of Peter. I hope it's encouraged you. I hope that uh, you've learned a lot. And uh, as we've been doing in this series, we always have someone else come up and share their thoughts on uh, what grace or what the topic means to them. So Ashlyn, you can come on up. Ashlyn is going to share what the grace of Jesus means to her. Thank you for your time. After this is over, we'll have communion and let's have a great week and be strong in the grace of the Lord. Amen. everyone. Um, A while ago, I actually made my mom a shirt about Grace because um, she likes Grace, like we all do. Um, But it was an acronym, and on the shirt it said, God's riches at Christ's expense. And so every single time that I hear the word Grace, I think of that. Um, I personally experience God's grace as, and his love as kind of two sides of the same coin. So Jesus died for me so that I can not only have his grace, but that I can intimately experience his love and the richness of community with him. And so I think that has really shaped my view of grace as I've grown as a disciple. So in scripture, we see why grace exists in Romans 5, 20 through 21, which says, the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but when sin increased, Grace increased all the more, so that just, in, just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're going to sin, and so that's why we need grace, because God knows that we need him no matter what, and that's the only way that we can actually like have community with him is by his grace. Then we also see what grace does in us in Acts 20, verse 32. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So we see what it does. It builds us up and it gives us his inheritance. So when I first became a disciple, I kind of always just saw grace as something saving me from something, saving me from sin or from unhealthy ways of life or from darkness. But as I've grown as a disciple, I've recognized and experienced the invitation to be vulnerable and deeply intimate with Jesus. So I know I can come to him with all of my undesirable emotions. I know that I can come to him with my hurts, my weaknesses, and my triumphs. And I know that God will never leave me, right? In Psalms, we always see um, the psalmist say, you know, I was in my despair. I was in like the darkest pit and God rescued me. God delivered me. And so I think that for me, I've seen that just as I've grown up. So in high school, I had amazing student leaders. Um, In college, I had an amazing campus ministry that I was a part of. And so I had friends to hold me accountable and everything. And so I think that Um, Just like what Fenton said is that grace holds us accountable, and grace is God giving me those people in my life to hold me accountable to um, be able to grow with him in community and with others in community. So that is what God's grace does in my life. Thank you.